I'm pretty sure because I said so is now a discouraged parenting technique. I'm also pretty sure most everyone here has been subjected to that technique on one or two occasions, if not more. And maybe you've even used it yourself. I know I've pulled it out on kids at camp before, and it's always on the exasperating kid who knows they're being exasperating and just keeps going and going and going. And in most cases, when your answer is finally, because I said so, they give it a sheepish grin and then go and do what they were asked to do to start with. Because I said so assumes that there is someone in authority and someone else has to obey. The recognition of Jesus' authority by Peter is central to this story. Peter keeps fishing because Jesus tells him to. If you say so, because you say so, that's enough to get Peter to cast his net again. I get a little squeamish, though, talking about obedience to authority. That language has been used abusively in the church and in plenty of other places in so many different ways. Still, recognizing Jesus' authority is key to our faith. There are plenty of things we do just because Jesus said so. Now, there's a version of Christianity that says if you are obedient, you get everything you want. It assumes the catch of fish is what matters in this story. The reward is what matters. Now, I'm not going to lie that most of us probably wish things worked out that way. You obey and you get rewarded beyond your wildest imagination. That's not the way it usually works out. The reality is that this catch of fish is miraculous even to the disciples. This is not their normal experience of Jesus. This is an extraordinary experience of Jesus. Most of what they do, most of what they will do, comes out of this same obedience. Because you say so without the immediate payoff. They find out early on that a life of discipleship is much more likely to be full of obedience without miracles than to mirror this scene. And so we're left wondering what on earth we do with because you say so. There's a quote on the wall of my office that reads, because the love of Christ compels me. It's from a book by Amy Jill Levine, a Jewish New Testament scholar who teaches at Vanderbilt Divinity School. In general, her take on Christian scripture is different than many scholars precisely because of her Jewish faith. The Good Samaritan isn't a phrase with much meaning for her, at least not apart from her studies, nor do the parables come pre-named like they do if you've been raised in a Christian tradition. But because the love of Christ compels me comes from a time when she is talking about the acts of mercy and justice Christians perform in their daily lives. She argues that those acts of mercy and justice are the better tools of evangelism than things like tracts shoved into people's hands. And she says, if people ask you why you do what you do, then you can simply answer, because the love of Christ compels me. I think this is the more charitable and maybe even more palatable version of obedience to Jesus. We're simply saying we do this because Jesus said so. We know that our faith in Jesus changes our actions. It is the love of Christ that compels us, not the equivalent of getting a giant catch of fish. Now, I'm not going to lie, I absolutely wish that there were a more tangible return on investment in following Jesus. But it is our action born out of obedience and love that ends up shaping us and shaping the world far more than a miracle that may never come. 
in the midst of things that our love of Christ compels us to do. Our actions rarely feel extraordinary or exciting. Over the last, over the course of the last year, we've actually learned a little too well that obedience can even be downright annoying. Probably knew that to start with, but it's gotten worse because the politicizing of everything COVID has become a nightmare, especially when we're talking about masks, and it remains so. As the CDC once again recommends wearing a mask indoors, even for vaccinated people, I'm one of the ones who is quite annoyed. I'd started to enjoy running into a store for a quick errand without a mask. Eating in an actual restaurant felt like a great treat for the three or so months that I've actually ventured into a restaurant. I would so much rather wear my glasses instead of contacts most of the time, The contacts don't fog up when wearing a mask. So if I need to wear a mask for a while, I wear contacts instead and put up with some dry and scratchy eyes and getting them in and out and all of those things. The list goes on. But there are many annoying little things that mean I don't want to wear that mask, but I still do. And for people whose faith turns us outward, people whose faith commands us to love our neighbors, people whose faith calls us to care for the most vulnerable among us, wearing a mask becomes one of those things we do because we follow Jesus. Weird as it may sound that this would be a way we obey Jesus. And now, while some of us rant about the people not getting vaccinated and worry about the pandemic of the unvaccinated, the truth is more complicated than it seems. Children and immunocompromised people can't be vaccinated. And The Atlantic just ran a lengthy article talking about the fact that the holdouts are not just the vocal anti-vaxxers. There are far more likely to be people who are poor and minorities. Like so many other needs in life, access to health care, lack of transportation, and misinformation are shaping the decisions of our poorest neighbors. Even taking off work can be a struggle, especially if a person experiences side effects and needs to take more time off work once they've received the vaccine. Medical testing performed without consent remains in enough memories that minorities are hesitant to receive the vaccine. It turns out it's not anti-vaxxers. It's people with legitimate needs and concerns who are among those who are unvaccinated. And not just among them, but most of them. So maybe even while we talk about obedience of wearing a mask and doing the right thing, maybe most of all the pandemic has made us recognize how much our obedience comes in loving the people who are very difficult to love. And continuing to love those difficult to love people through so many ups and downs through a season that has uprooted all of our lives. Nothing about that feels like a nice catch of fish. Doesn't change, but that's our response to Jesus. As we've continued through the coaching process, discerning, selling our building, and now our future after my departure, one of the realities about Chalice that we've named is that for some people, We are a pit stop on their journey. They need to find a place where they can be Christian and liberal or Christian and gay or Christian and trans or Christian and a whole bunch of other identities. They desperately need a Christian community to welcome them if only for a short season. They desperately need exactly who Jesus has called Chalice to be. 
Now, progressive Christians tend to have a reputation, at least in certain circles, for not really caring about obedience to God or Scripture, maybe not even really reading it. So it seems worth noting that Chalice is who we are because of the call of Jesus. And when we talk about our call, when we use the scriptures that we share with so many other Christians, it's worth noting that we're not citing obscure passages to justify the fullness of the way we welcome people. Whether they be asylum seekers or homeless neighbors or the many different sorts of people who just need a stop on their journey. The truth is, our welcome is an act of obedience to following Jesus' call found in Scripture, not in one place, but written deeply as part of the story of what it means to be a disciple. In fact, the story of Ruth might just get all of those people, all of the ones we want to welcome, rolled into one story. If you don't remember, there's a famine in the land, and so people are displaced out of hunger. They become refugees fleeing, looking for asylum wherever they may find it. They settle in a land that has more food, but is still struggling to overcome the famine 10 years later. And so when Ruth, a woman who just as introduced in this story, when Ruth's husband dies, her mother-in-law Naomi tries to send Ruth back to her people. Ruth refuses, choosing to stay with Naomi, pledging herself to her. In fact, for many years, the words Ruth pledged to Naomi were read at weddings since they so reflect our views of marriage. They were common enough that even I know the King James version of those vows. Whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Following those vows, the women flee to Bethlehem, where Ruth gleans for their food. In that land, God's people do not clear the fields completely, but leave the extra for the poorest in the land to come and pick enough food to sustain them. Ruth is among those poorest people, gathering the edges of the barley field so that she and Naomi have enough to eat. We usually talk about the rest of the story, where Ruth ends up married to a man named Boaz. But the setup, the setup has a whole other depth to it when we are talking about our faith and who God calls us to be. There are at least a dozen more stories we could mention if we chose if we chose to when talking about the tangible ways we obey God's call. And you know what? As beautiful and holy and life-changing as our obedience as obedience to our call is, it's not the giant catch a fish. That reality is frustrating and annoying, and often we'd be happy for a catch with even a few fish, not needing the nets to be full and breaking. And still we hear Peter's words echo in our own lives. Because you say so. Because you say so is the answer of faith. Because you say so is the answer of faith, fish or not. Because you say so is the answer of a disciple. 
and a disciple that chooses to follow Jesus, come what may. Amen.